USHSR The Future of USA High Speed Rail What is holding back US High Speed Rail? The possibilities for high speed rail innovation are many, and once the lasting infrastructure is built, the benefits to communities are long lasting. Many people travel to Europe and Asia and use their sleek and modern high speed trains, and when traveling to the USA, they questioned why the country doesn't have any. And like the rest of our infrastructure, we're way behind the rest of the world right now. We need to remember we're in competition with the rest of the world. People come here and set up businesses, people stay here, people grow because of the ability to access, access transportation, access all the infrastructure. In the alternate world, depicted by graphic artist Alfred Tu, is the vision of an America whose major cities are all connected by state-of-the-art 220 miles per hour trains. In short, it's a mass transit lover's wildest dream. What is high-speed rail and who has it? While there is no set definition of what high-speed rail is, it is a type of rail transport that runs significantly faster than traditional rail. Generally, lines that are built to handle speeds above 250 km per hour, 155 miles per hour, and upgraded lines in excess of 200 km per hour, 124 miles per hour, are considered to be high speed. To win the 21st century, we've got to move. China already has 23,000 miles of high-speed rail, 220 miles per hour, two-thirds of all the high-speed rail in, in, in the world, 220 miles an hour. And the way, and they're, and they're working on uh, transit on trains that can go as high as 400 miles an hour. We're behind the curb. Today, China has by far the most high-speed rail in the world, with over 40,000 kilometers of high-speed rail as of 2022. That's over two-thirds of the world's total high-speed rail. Not only that, but it also has the fastest high-speed rail in regular operation. By 2021, 75% of Chinese cities, with a population of 500,000 or more, had high-speed railing. The network is expected to expand in length again to 70,000 kilometers, 43,000 miles, by 2035. Why U.S. Don't Support High-Speed Rail Network High-speed rail remains something of a foreign concept for many Americans. Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg's proposal to make the United States a world leader in high-speed rail. Uh, now we've got to take things to the next level. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you look at what not just famously, uh, you know, uh, let's say uh, our fellow, uh, uh, you know, our, our counterparts in, in Japan are, are able to enjoy, but, uh, you know, really across the world, a place like uh, the UK or, or, or Turkey, I want the U.S. to be leading the world when it comes to access to high-speed uh, rail. And, and I think we have a real opportunity to do that, especially with the bipartisan appetite for real investments that we have before us this year. However, this would add more than $4 trillion to the federal debt for the construction of new rail lines, plus tens of billions of dollars of annual deficit spending to subsidize operating costs. In exchange, such a high-speed rail network is likely to carry less than 2% of the nation's passenger travel and no freight. In U.S., high-speed trains were rendered obsolete in 1958, six years before Japan opened its first bullet train when Boeing 707 entered commercial service. The airliner could cruise at more than twice the top speeds of the fastest scheduled high-speed trains today. Air travel cost more than rail travel in 1964, but average airfares today are less than a fifth of the average fares paid by riders of the Amtrak Asela, the only high-speed train operating in the United States. The main disadvantage of high-speed trains, other than their slow speeds compared with air travel, is that they require a huge amount of infrastructure that must be built and maintained to extremely precise standards. Since the United States is struggling to maintain the infrastructure it already has, particularly its urban rail transit systems and Amtrak's Northeast Corridor, which together have more than $200 billion in maintenance backlogs, it makes no sense to build more infrastructure that the nation won't be able to afford to maintain. 
Buttigieg's proposal is particularly poorly timed, considering that the COVID-19 pandemic has made many people question mass transportation in general. One lesson of the pandemic is that the most resilient transportation system in U.S. is motor vehicles and highways. Some experts suggest, rather than funding an obsolete system, but Buttigieg and Congress should find ways to relieve congestion, improve safety, and increase people's access to jobs and other economic opportunities by improving existing roads and building more highways that could be paid for with user fees. Could the U.S. ever get high-speed rail? There are three high-speed rail projects underway in the U.S. Brightline is well ahead of the curve in construction and operation. Indeed, it is currently operating between Miami and West Palm Beach, with multiple train sets and hourly departures. Moreover, Brightline has completed its line from West Palm Beach to Orlando, and crews are currently making qualifying runs along this route, with regular service scheduled to be either late 2022 or early 2023. The line connecting Orlando to Tampa also is in the planning phases. At this point, Brightline is a higher speed system, as its trains approach 80 miles per hour along portions of the Florida East Coast, right away it uses. Technically, HSR is considered by most to be 200 plus miles per hour. However, when the railroad opens its own West Palm Beach to Orlando segment, trains will operate at 125 miles per hour in some areas, blurring the line between high speed and higher speed rail. The second big USHSR project is run by the California High Speed Rail Authority, CHSRA, with a genuinely high speed line between San Francisco and Los Angeles currently under construction. Finally, there is Texas Central, with plans for an HSR line between Dallas and Houston. However, construction has not gotten off the ground due to various problems, including the recent resignation of its CEO and a court battle over the question of eminent domain.